good. Good. Hello. Let's see. Okay. Sorry, it's hard to hear myself from up here. Uh, hi, my name is Evan Raskov. I uh, teach computational art, computational design, and I do strange things like live coding. Uh, I played algorithms. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of an algorithm. Anybody? One of you, two of you, yes, okay. If you've not, uh, check it out, it's fun. Anyway, what, I, what I'm going to talk about is a system called Live Printer. Uh, the idea is it's supposed to be an open source, cybernetic 3D printing system. Um, what does that mean? So uh, what I really wanted to do is deconstruct 3D printing. So uh, I, I'm going to be really critical of 3D printing and say that there's some huge difficulties with it. Uh, I really like it and it's got amazing potential. Um, and on the high end is something very different from the low end. What I'm really talking about is low end desktop 3D printing that most of us have seen with Ultimakers and uh, MakerBots and whatnot. So I just want to make that distinction. Uh, I want to really deconstruct that process. I want to rebuild it and then start to re-evolve it around people and makers and not necessarily as an offshoot of an industrial manufacturing process. Uh, and I want to make it live. And uh, when I say live, I mean live as in the sense of like just directly controlling these things, cutting out kind of middleman, if you would. And uh, there's some little shapes that I've made live with this system. So to kind of go back a bit, the reason I got here is because I was trying to make data sculptures. And I thought it'd be really interesting to just uh, create these kind of computational sculptures and then 3D print them out. And then, uh, you know, something that's not, something you couldn't sculpt by hand. So, you know, creating a virtual object and then turning it directly with some code into a physical object. Uh, I kind of thought the system would be something like this, where I start out with a design concept and then I just stick it in some modeling software, uh, which then you put in some software that develops tool paths, and then you stick it in a printer and it's done. Right? That's kind of the workflow I thought it was going to be. Uh, and, you know, so I made these shapes, I developed some computational software that took sound and then wrapped it into these nice spirals, and I made sure it looked kind of pretty. And, um, and you know, I got some really nice results out of it. Uh, you know, I mean, th these things did work, and again, you know, I'm not trashing 3D printing, I think, you can make amazing shapes like this that I definitely could not do by hand, you know, because of the precision of how it's done. Um, but the real system was something more like this, okay? And uh, there were some extra steps in there, like all these extra software packages I had to use to clean up and fix models that I never thought I'd have to do. Uh, and there's a lot of, like, feedback in the system, where you start out with an idea, and then you put it in some fixing software, and you realize that you've got holes in your meshes, and it was never going to work anyway, so you have to go rethink your design. And the constant feeding back of it uh, took tons and tons of time. And, I mean, this took me, I don't know, I thought it was going to be, like, a month. It took me, like, probably, you know, two years of work in the end to get some interesting stuff out of it. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, even, is you get a lot of plastic waste because you've gone through tons of trials, you've wasted tons of electricity, you've got buckets of plastic, uh, you've got many frustrated lost working hours. So it was a very frustrating experience. Um, so I've, uh, I started writing a paper on this and doing some real experiments. Um, and this is sort of an un unpublished paper, hopefully to be published soon, uh, where I, I actually looked at you know, how can I print different classes of shapes and what are some uh, interesting things that the geometry might show us about how we can then print shapes in new ways. Uh, and even got so far as to get out like infrared cameras and start to look at like cooling patterns on this because I was kind of inspired by past papers in 3D printing. Um, but really, you know, if you get back to the heart of it, so, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, and, uh, and what I'm really looking at a lot of times is experiential learning and, you know, how that feeds back into my work. So, uh, I'm, I'm taking John Dewey's experiential learning cycle, and I'm very much in that kind of abductive phase of trying to intuitively create objects and then learn from the creation of these objects. And the problem with 3D printing is that this phase takes way too long. You know, if I'm in a wood shop, you know, I can cut some wood, I can instantly see what the problem is. And, you know, I may be a bit crap at it for a while, but I know where I'm going to go with it, and I can learn, and I can get better. Whereas with 3D printing, I just felt like, I mean, you know, going back to the cycle again, you know, you've got so many different places things can go wrong, and they're all independent. You know, is the material printing at the right temperature? Is the thing going at the right speed? Was your geometry okay? I mean, you know, there's just a ton of things that you can't really control for when you're learning. So I want to then reinvent this into a new system, okay? And, uh, and I think it, what, what the heart of this problem with 3D printing is that there's two modes of thinking. 
Okay, there's what we have today versus the future. And with today, uh, what we're making is planned. So we start out with a workflow where we create something, we model it, uh, we want to make something then exactly based on that, like an exact copy in our 3D printer. Right? So sort of inductive thinking. We have a hypothesis. We have an idea of what we want to make. Uh, it's deliberate, right? It's representative. We're trying to make an object that's a representation of something. It's pre-planned, and it's sort of step by step. Right? And the problem with that is that if there's an error, then you have to chuck the thing out. Right? It's like do or die. Uh, but there's other ways of making, and you could argue this a bit more like a cybernetic or performative way of making, which is to build up an object based on consecutive actions, which again is sort of the classic way of, uh, of making objects, you know, where you start out in a design and you're working with a material and you're letting the material kind of lead you through a process. Okay? So you, you're kind of working on the intuition of making. You're exploring what the material can do and the process and the form can do. Uh, you're improvising. Okay? In the first system, you can't improvise. You've already planned the thing out, and you have to go through the whole process. But here, you can kind of change steps. Uh, and it's a bit generative. I mean, this is you know, arguably what generative systems are like. You, know, you set up some rules, and then you play out the system, and then you see what happens with it. Uh, it's also a bit functional. Okay? So uh, again, you know, errors are actually an interesting part of this process. They're expected, and they're something that you want because you can then integrate that into the final design, like your happy accidents. So to kind of illustrate that, I know it's kind of a big concept, and, uh, and it's actually, you know, it, what they say about theories is that every theory is wrong, but some are useful, okay? So that's how I'm thinking about that as an overarching theory. Uh, but if you look at just making a circle, right? Uh, the green circle on the left, I think of as like the pre-planned circle, right? You know the equation of a circle, you generate a set of points at the beginning, and then you can connect them with lines. Uh, on the right is a more performative circle, where you start out at a point, uh, that tiny white dot all the way to the right. You start out at a point, and you just move in a distance, and then turn, and move in a distance, and turn, and you keep repeating. And if there's any errors, then maybe your circle's off by a little bit, but it could still be interesting. Okay, it can recover from those mistakes. Whereas in the kind of first one, if you are off, then your shape is mushed from the beginning. So, how does liveness come into this, right? Uh, well, liveness is, in a sense of 3D printing, you know, again, this direct control of 3D printing. And uh, liveness to me, as someone who performs with code, is a sense that you can take, uh, you can actually use control structures. Okay, so I know 3D printing right now, you have systems where you can send G-code and you can sort of manipulate, you know, you, you can send commands basically to a 3D printer, but that's not the same as code. You know, as anyone knows with code, code is rich and it has algorithms and variables and functional structures and repetition, and that's something that we don't have with 3D printing right now on an immediate level. Um, and user need. So, you know, going back to what Eric said at the beginning, uh, I've seen a lot of use cases of people innovating with their 3D printers and making machines. I've s seen some amazing hacks of machines where people are using, like, Microsoft Excel to, like, generate points to feed to their 3D printer. So, like, it's already happened. I don't want to say I've invented this, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm helping to birth this system that actually can help people. Uh, and then it kind of creates this interesting blend of, like, performance and manufacturing which has some interesting precedents with like ballet and GM, if, you, if anyone knows about that weird side story, which I can't get to now, unfortunately. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting, you know, being, again, someone who performs with code, what if you perform with manufacturing and code? Like, what does that even look like? So again, you know, it's a lot of stuff is already around. You know, I don't, I don't want to say that what I'm doing is radically different, but I think the framing of it's radically different. Because RepRap has web control. You have things like CNCJS, where you can, again, send G-code and command line stuff. Uh, you have Octoprint, and you have G-code and CNC macros already. And you know, some software has this sort of sense of liveness in it. Um, but 3D printing doesn't. And I think that's really interesting that it has that kind of big blind sight right now. So for a system, I mean, what that means is lightweight control. So I think, you know, you want to have a system where you can send commands and, you know, not have a really heavy syntax, make things be very responsive, so that whatever you type in, you know, you can have intuition and exploration in the moment and not have to wait for things to render. You have immediacy. Uh, you need a compact language that people can understand and can use. And you need to really get start, uh, get printing quickly. 
uh, which is anyone who's done 3D printing knows is not an easy thing because, I mean, this is a physical thing, right? Like, you've got to heat it up, you've got to put the filament in. Uh, I mean, the other day I was actually trying to do performance with this, and, uh, and the smoke alarm went off, and I thought it was the printer, so I shut it down, and I jammed the printing head because it cooled down too fast. And, you know, when you're in the moment, that's, you know, it's hard to recover from that. It takes time. Okay. So hopefully, you know, the system makes things easier. And you can see some experiments just trying to do like a kind of rectangular fill. You know, I think you can experiment with things you couldn't normally experiment with uh, in the moment. Uh, and I mean, the system itself that I've, I've developed is fairly complex. Uh, that diagram's on the website, so, you know, it's got too much information for now. But uh, the gist I want to get out of it is that it's a very portable system where you have a web browser uh, which can run on any computer and you have basically, basically a Python backend, which started out as a hacked version of some open source software that controls Ultimakers and is now more of its own thing. So it's sort of a two-tier system where you're having um, live coding in a browser, and then it's going to basically just send uh, compile down to G code for printer. Okay, that's the gist of it. Kind of a simple idea. There's a lot of housekeeping involved in that that's not so fun and simple. Um, the way it works is getting in two modes. So I've got this idea of representational and performative modes in it. So you can put things in coordinate by coordinate if you kind of know what you're doing or you want to generate things uh, more exactly. Uh, and there's just simple commands like moving and extruding and fill. Okay, very, you know, it's very simple stuff. Uh, or you can work relatively where you have commands. And you know, this really goes back to the days of turtle graphics, right? Where you're like, move, extrude, turn, all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, why mess with a classic, you know? So, uh, you know, what that looks like on the bottom, right now this is in JavaScript, but it can also be in Python. There's a compiler for that as well. Um, and hopefully it has its own language soon. But right now it looks like lp.distance and then 100 millimeters dot thickness, and then you set that in millimeters dot the angle you want to move at dot speed dot go. So that's, that might be a typical command line and you can set and unset those as it goes. And, uh, you know, again, to kind of lay out, a, again, a bit of theory of where I'm kind of staking my ground, you know, I'm calling this live computational sculpting. And I think it's an interesting blend of this idea of live coding performance, this idea of cybernetics as a science of control. Uh, computer controlled manufacturing, which was kind of developed more of an industrial level, and then design research, which I don't know if many of you really are familiar with that term, but it's sort of the idea that, you know, a lot of designers innovate in practice, so, you know, you're not building things for other people, but you're building things as a designer for yourself in collaboration with others. So, it's somewhere in there. And again, this, this diagram's on the website. It takes a bit of theory, I think, and understanding to get to the heart of. But the idea of live computational sculpting, I think, has some merit. Um, so, to wrap up, I think the future of this now, what I'd like is, A, some participation, because it'd be really great to get more people on board. Um, I'd like to look at materials testing, because there really doesn't exist a system for actually testing materials in 3D printing. And it's, I found out it's a, pretty much a fiction as to like what stuff prints at. Um, like 210 degrees Celsius for like some materials, like yeah, whatever. I mean like maybe 190, maybe 195, maybe at some angle, maybe not. You know, there's no way to test that right now. So in an easy way. Uh, I'd like to redevelop tool paths that work and maybe computational shapes. Uh, look at the workflow of plastics. For, uh, for physics, uh, sorry, the workflow of physics for plastics, um, you know, extrusion, retraction, dripping, you know, there's lots of interesting side effects that I've discovered with this. Uh, look at live generative shapes, like playing Game of Life on a 3D printer, live. Uh, education, it's really good for it, understand 3D printing. And uh, hopefully then the end is re-evolving the hardware of 3D printing and thinking about alternate systems for it so we can, you know, build them with this kind of human practitioner in mind, maybe it's more of a piece of collaborative performance than it's like an offshoot of industrial manufacturing. And, uh, and then actually performing with it, which I'm hoping to do at a live coding conference where we make music with it, because uh, they sound fun too. So that's it. There's the URL for GitHub, and uh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I can question too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the question was about designing in virtual reality. Um, yeah, actually, I didn't really mention that, but I think, I think augmented reality could be amazing for this. Um, maybe virtual reality as well, but I mean, I'd love to see a 3D printer that had some sort of live overlay so you could sort of trace out paths in the, sh in the shape. I mean, what I tried to avoid with this, though, is doing too much pre-virtualization because I really wanted people to actually focus on the printer in front of them, you know, and kind of get that intuition with it. So I'm not so sure about full VR, but I mean, definitely AR would be really fascinating with 3D printing. Yeah. Right, do I have time for one more, do you think? Yeah, one more question or... Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, and I've made many mistakes live. <laughs> I think uh, right now the system is really at like a proof of concept phase. Um, I mean, I've got it working right now, and I've made stuff with it, but I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I, think, I think the tools need to evolve a bit to fit that method of working. I don't think they're there yet, um, but I think, you know, some of the 3D printing systems that maybe have like a bigger blob or like robot arms, you know, can really support that kind of real life and sculpting. I mean, I think then you call it, you know, computational sculpting rather than 3D printing in a way to kind of differentiate. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the question is, what do you make out of that? I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, data sculpture is one thing. I've been talking to people about doing live, uh, live physicalizations of like pollution data in cities, which is kind of an interesting thing to build up. You know, I think there's some things, but, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to get more use cases of interesting stuff to do with it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty slow, actually. Yeah. Uh, when I did, I did a workshop just this past weekend, and I wound up making lots of bracelets for kids because it was <laughs> it was quite fast, and I had to explain it to five-year-olds, which is always quite difficult. It's easy to just you know make a generative shape and give it to them. Um, I think what's interesting is uh, textiles. I, I've been working in a department that has lots of people printing on textiles and adding tension and shape to them. And I think for that, there's a lot of really immediate applications because that's very quick. Um, for actually building up big shapes, yeah, again, I think we need to think about what that workflow is. And it's like, do you do code in shapes and start them and then come back again? You know, yeah, there, there's a lot of questions around that. I don't have an easy answer to that yet, I think. That's something to explore. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.